Hello everyone, welcome to my video series on PEG 18F microcontroller programming. In this video, I'm not going to introduce a new peripheral in PEG microcontrollers, but I'm going to introduce you to a pretty cool dude you come across almost everywhere. In the next few minutes, I'll be talking about keybeds, how they work, and how to interface them with PEG microcontroller. Without further ado, let's jump into it. An important thing in an embedded project is its user interface. For a project to be awesome and appealing to the customer, it should have a practical dandy interface. Keybeds are one of the most common peripherals you can see in embedded applications. Cell phones, calculators, and ADM machines, just to name a few. Anyway, who doesn't know the good old number keypad from the landline line phone? Now comes the question, how does this device actually work? Remember the time when you tried to break inside your landline phone to see what lies below these buttons? Today we finally reveal the mystery for you. Simply, a keypad is just an array of push buttons, and this array is arranged in a two-dimensional or matrix form to save the number of pins required to interface it. Let's take the standard number keypad as an example. It has 12 buttons, 10 for the digits from 0 to 9, 1 for the asterisk, and 1 for the hair sign. And if we were to assign one pin for each button, and then deal with each one individually, the same way you did with buttons in the previous videos, then interfacing keypads is simple and easy, which doesn't make sense. Not because it's easy and simple, but because you'll end up consuming your microcontroller pins, which is not a good thing at all. And if your keypad has more buttons, maybe something like your computer keyboard, this simple solution is not even close to practical. So, in order to make the number of lines or pins less, the buttons are arranged in a row and column matrix. For our keypad, it's a 4x3 matrix, and here we need to assign one pin for each row and one pin for each column, which cuts the number of pins to 7. A good question is, how are we supposed to know which button is pressed? And if you're impressed by this elegant solution, you should know that elegant is not easy, so pay attention. Here we peel off the keypad and it looks like this from inside. One thing to note here, there is no connection between rows and columns, so pressing a button connects one row and one column together. For example, pressing the 3 button connects column number 3 with row number 1. And pressing the 5 button connects column number 2 with row number 2. So far so good, we know what happens once we press a button, but don't know yet how can we detect which button is pressed. Ok, we connected the 4 rows to pins RP4 to RP7 and put pull up resistors so we have 5 volts on each row and all the columns are connected to their volt or ground, we go on and press on the 3 key. Now we've connected row 1 to column 3, so row 1 is now connected to their volt and so does pin RP4. But this is only half the way. We know for sure that one out of three keys is pressed, either key 1, key 2, or key 3, because pressing any of these keys connects row 1 to ground. Definitely this is good but not enough, we need a solid evidence on which button is pressed. Here is a brilliant solution. And instead of connecting the three columns to ground, we connect them to any three pins in the microcontroller. Say pins RB0 to RB2. And make these pins out by zero volt. So pressing any of the three buttons in the first row connects row 1 to zero volt. So far we've done nothing new, but if we ground only one column at a time, so if I write a 0 to this column and 1 to the other column, the only way row 1 is connected to 0 is when the 1 key is pressed. You can pause the video and convince yourself this is true. Then we shift the 0 and put it on column number 2. So the only way we get a 0 in row 1 is when the 2 key is pressed. Then we shift the 0 again, make it on the third column, and if the 3 key is pressed, then row 1 is connected to 0 volt. Let's clear it further and take another example. Again we put zeros in all columns and we press the 5 key, then the second row is connected to 0. But how can we detect that a key is pressed in the first place? We connected the rows to these pins specifically for a reason. You can pause the video if you want to think about it. 
Okay, these pins can trigger port B on a change interrupt we've seen in the last video. Since these pins are pulled up, they read once when there is no button presses. But once we press a button, one out of these pins is connected to zero and triggers the interrupt. And it's our job to figure out which key is pressed. So again, we put zeros on all columns and we press the 5 key. It connects row 2 to ground, triggers the interrupt, and we know that one of the keys in the second row is pressed. So we apply the same method we've seen earlier, put a zero on this pin, since it's not the 4 keys that we pressed, then row 2 is connected to 1. Then we shift the zero, it appears on column 2, and since it's the 5 key we've pressed, then the zero appears on the second row, and now we know for certain it's the five keys that was pressed. And no need to shift the zero again. Okay, and now five minutes of the slides. Let's go and see the circuit on Protus. Here I connected the first row to RB7, the second row to RB6, and so on. And then the first column to RB0, the second one to RB1, and the third to RB2. Far away in board A, we've connected four LEDs from RA0 to RA3. And whatever number you press on the keypad is displayed on these LEDs, of course in binary four. This LED represents the least significant bit, and this one represents the most significant bit. Here we go and try it. I press number five, and here it is, 0101, which is five in binary. Again, hit seven. 0, 1, 1, 1, and the last row displays 0 on the LEDs. Then we move on to writing code. And this time it's not going to be as easy as any of the projects we did so far. Okay, open MP Lab, start a new project, and as usual, copy the configuration bits in the description section below, and let's get it done. This two-dimensional array here with four rows and three columns represents the keybed we're using in this project. Don't forget that we are counting from 0, not 1, so we start from row 0 and column 0, not row 1 and column 1. Inside the main function, write OXF0 to try SP register, making the high 4 pins input and the low 4 pins output and initially put zeros on the output pins of port B. When the microcontroller powers up, pins RA0 to RA3 are analog pins or analog input pins. So this slide makes them digital inputs and we write to try a register. So we have these pins configured as output pins by clearing trice A. Go down and enable board B on a change and drop. Then enable the GIE bit in Intercon register. Finally, to save time connecting pull up resistors, we activate the port B built in pull ups. Then write the infinite while loop. Again, nothing to be done inside of it. So we go down to the ISR. As usual, check the flag bit. Then we define two variables, one called row for holding the row number in which the key was pressed, and the other variable for holding the column number. And we need a little bit of detective work to find out which key was pressed. First, we gotta find the row. So we use the switch case block. First case, it's OX70, meaning pin RB7 is connected to zero. And this pin RP7 is connected to the first row, so we set row to zero. Break, and we go to the second case. If port B register equals OXP0, meaning there is a zero on RB6. And don't forget that the lower four bits of port B are set to zeros before the interrupt is triggered. So, if it's true since RB6 is connected to the second row, then we set row to 1. And same goes for the last two rows. And to avoid mysterious behavior, includes the default case, that's when you release a key and interrupt is triggered. And in this case, all rows are connected to VCC. And there is nothing to do except a little bit of housekeeping, so clear the flag bit and go outside the ISR. So. We figured out which row the key pressed belongs to. Now comes the part we find out which column. 
We start by putting a zero on our B0 or the first column and one in the other two columns. If the key pressed is in the first column, then one of the four rows will be connected to zero. So the upper four bits in port B are not going to be all ones and the condition is true. Note that the lower four bits will not change. They are what we said in the line above here. So, go inside and make the column variable equal zero. If the key was not in the first column, then port B will be OXF6. The condition is false and go to else block. Then, shift the zero to RB1 or column two. Then, check port B again. If it's not OXF5, meaning one of the four upper bits is zero, so go inside, set column to one, else shift the zero again, put it on RB2. Same logic here. Actually, this step is not essential, because if the key is not either on the first column or the second column, it must be on the third one. Anyway, we did it, so in this line we get the key pressed, using the row and column as index in the keys array. Then we display the result on port A, and since the maximum number we can get is 9 from the key bed, then we only need 4 pins, and hence we connect it for LEDs. And this line was about throwing my whole project because I forgot to add it. And it puts the zeros again on the column, so we get an interrupt again when a key is pressed. Finally, one line that explains itself, we clear the flag bit and we're done. If you made it to the end of the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss my next video on timers. Thank you guys for watching, peace.